May this video be the flame that warms your heart, illuminating your path with the light of love and acceptance. Visionary Women is a volunteer-run uh, organization, and I know that every single person who is here is giving their time to one organization or another. And the fact that you have nine million volunteers, and you were talking about the relationship between volunteerism and willingness, and that it's through willingness that you uplift your consciousness, if I'm quoting you correctly, or I'm understanding it. In some ways, talking about how it could be a doorway to becoming a bigger person than mm -hmm. who you are. See, uh, before we come to women, first thing is visionary. What a vision and vision means is, see everybody has desires. Desire is an incre incremental way of enhancing our life. Today you desire, I must have a home, tomorrow you desire, I must have this money, tomorrow you desire something else. These are incremental ways of arranging and rearranging our lives, mm -hmm. which are needed to do a few things. When you say, I'm a visionary, what you are saying is, I have a larger desire, which is not about just incremental improvement of my life. Desire is about me always. Vision is an all-in… all-inclusive process. So, this itself is a phenomenal thing. If people, instead of having desires, if they have a vision, vision is always all-inclusive. Desire is personal. Desire leads to incremental changes and improvements. Vision can transform the whole situation. I like music <laughs> So, uh, about willingness, because you said you're a volunteer organist, to be a volunteer. A volunteer means somebody who is doing something willingly, right? There's no other compulsion. There are no financial compulsions, there are no social compulsions, there is no something else. You want to do something willingly. So when you're a willing participant right now, you're a volunteer. I'm asking all of you, right now, are you compelled to be here or are you here voluntarily? Oh, thank you <laughs> Because I've sp spoken to conscripted people also. <laughs> I've spoken in the prisons, I've spoken in many places <laughs> So you're here willingly, you're doing something willingly is the fundamental of your joy, isn't it so? Hello? However simple or stupid or idiotic activity it is, I'm doing something willingly makes a world of difference, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. The difference between heaven and hell is just this. You're doing something willingly, that's your heaven. You're doing something unwillingly, that's your hell. Hmm? We have already taken on attitudes, what we like and what we don't like. I like this person, I don't like this person. Now with this person I will do things willingly, with this person I'll do things un unwillingly. This may be two people, two aspects of life, two communities, two nations, two many things. This I will do willingly, this I do unwillingly. This means I've decided in my mind this is good, this is bad. When I hear even on national news channels, good guys and bad guys, it just… Once you have this kind of thing, you are going to be disastrous to the planet. It's just a question of time. The moment you decide this is a good person, this is a bad person, this has gone deep into American society, no. There are no good people and bad people. Everybody is oscillating between the two. If you create a very pleasant, wonderful atmosphere, everybody behaves wonderfully. If you create an unpleasant atmosphere, a whole lot of people act nasty. Yes or no? There are joyful people and miserable people, but there are no good people and bad people. The… the moment we think we are good, 
we are entitled to destroy the bad, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we've been destroying a lot of people for a long time. Time to stop that <laughs> because human beings are in different levels of experience and understanding, variety of people. Anybody who is not like you is obviously bad, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it so? Those who are not like me must be bad people. Because the basis of goodness and what you think is goodness is decided by you. No, you have no business to do that. Willing means this, I'm just willing. I'm a hundred percent yes to life. I am not yes to this one, no to this one, no. I am just yes and yes to life. If you are a hundred percent yes to life, you are a volunteer. Oh, that's you have become a willing life. You have become so willing that you have no will of your own. People ask me, Sadhguru, how do you operate with all these people? All kinds of horrible questions they're asking, they're doing this, they're doing that. I said, my life is not about them, it's about me. It's about how I am. It's about me. It doesn't matter how they are, that's their choice. But how I am is my choice. This is my way. No matter what they do, I'm like this. Because I have not given that freedom to anybody, that somebody can freak me, somebody can make me angry, somebody can make me happy, somebody can make me unhappy. These privileges I kept to myself. It's time you do that too, because if somebody else can decide what can happen within you right now, isn't this the ultimate slavery? Huh? Isn't this? Someone else can decide what should happen within you. What happens around you, of course, sim so many people decide. Hmm? What happens around us is not hundred percent ours, but what happens within me must be my making, isn't it? Right now, just about anybody can freak anybody because they're not volunteers, they're unwilling. Volunteering means you have no will of your own, you can do whatever is needed. You know, we are a volunteer organization, this means uh, all kinds of people. <laughs> Most of them are not qualified for the jobs that they're doing <laughs> And I cannot fire them because they're volunteers <laughs> <laughs> so people keep coming up to me on a daily basis, they say, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, she's so horrible, I can't do it. I tell them, see, in this world, this is the sort of people who exist, like this, like this, like this, like this, this is the kind of people there are. But if you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven. And today, <laughs> today. But if you think what you're doing is very significant, you must learn to work with all these horrible people. This is how the world is. If you think what you're doing is very significant, you learn to work with all kinds of people. You will see horrible people will do wonderful things. Yes? Yes. But if you want to work with ideal people, you won't find any, I haven't found one yet. <laughs> all kinds of mixed bags, yes. but <laughs> if you are willing that you are not yes and no, yes to one, no to another, you're simply one big yes, you will find a way. Only one question, Guruji, we the human beings in the earth are by chance, or by choice of God or any superpower. Why we are on this planet? <laughs> by accident or by design or a superpower? I think even the planet is wondering why the hell these human beings came here <laughs> <clears throat> See, uh, the solar system, the way it is, and so as the other universal systems, the galaxies, they're all happening because they arrive at a certain perfection of geometry. Geometry in the sense, right now this planet is going around the sun, it's found its perfect orbit.
So it's going and going and going. Not powered by engine or something. See, the airplane is going, powered by engines. It's being pushed. This is not being pushed. This has just found a certain perfe perfection of geometry and it's going on. The day it loses its perfection of geometry, if it loses the line of orbit, it's gone. So in this process, life happens on this planet, also involving this geometry on various levels. We say in the yogic culture, we say a human being is physiologically and in terms of brain has reached its peak physiologically. That is, after a million years you will not have a horn coming out of your head or something else, like the tail disappeared, something else will disappear, this cannot happen. We are saying this from a certain context. Today the modern neuroscientists are saying similar things. They're saying the size of the neuron in the human brain can neither increase nor in can the wiring inside can increase because the physical laws don't permit it. The laws of physics do not permit it. I will not go into the detail of that. To put it very simply, how we see it is, your birth here, right now all life on this planet is solar powered, isn't it? Yes? It is the sun's energy which is doing all this. Human… B uh, and also this, uh, the revolutions and the rotations of the moon also has influence upon us. The very ocean is rising and falling with the movement of the moon. Only because our mother's bodies were in tune with the cycle of the moon, we are born and we are here. Yes? If this twenty-eight day cycle of the moon does not repeat itself in a woman's body, you and me wouldn't be born. So because it has reached that, we say physically, the physical laws have take… come to a certain place where life upon this planet cannot evolve further. You can make use of what you have in a much better way. Using the same technology, we had a dumb phone, then we had a smartphone, now we have an iPhone. Like this we can go on improving it, how we use it. But the fundamental physical laws will not permit any further evolution of this creature. So did it happen by accident? No. The theory of evolution, you know Charles Darwin? Who made a monkey out of you? <laughs> not me, him. If you look at the theory of evolution, which was propounded just hundred and fifty years ago, we have said this thousands of years ago, in the sense, you know the ten avatars, at least the nine you know those who have come. What is the first one? Ah, matsya avatar. Matsya avatara means fish or water life. All life on this planet started under water. What is the next avatar? Kurma avatar, amphibious like a turtle, half in the water, half on the land. The next one is Varaha Avatara, a pig or a wild boar. Among the mammals, one animal which is strongly, strongly rooted in its body is a wild boar. See, we, we live next to the forest, we see this. The tribal boys can kill a deer with a stick. If you hit it with a stick, it'll fall dead. The local dogs will hunt the deer, but a wild boar, you try to kill him and see, it's not easy to kill him. You go smash him with a car, his spine is broken, still he will go, he will not stop. Because he's so physically rooted, his life is so physical. So the next form of life was Varahavatara. This simply means the creator is finding expression in first as fish, then as a turtle, then as a wild boar, next one is Narasimha, half… half man, half animal, next one is Vamana, a dwarfed man. Next one is a full-grown man but volat emotionally volatile man who is Parishurama. Next one is a peaceful man which is Rama. Next is a loving man which is a Krishna. Next is a meditative man which is a Buddha. The next is supposed to be a mystical being yet to come, okay? This is running very much in parallel lines with the Darwin's theory of evolution. Yes or no? It's in the same sequence, exactly in the same sequence. Darwin propounded his theory only hundred and fifty years ago. This was said twelve to fifteen thousand years ago. Adiyogi himself spoke about it. 
So, if you observe life, you can clearly see from what is inanimate, basic life formed, from that life evolved. We've always seen it that way. Always we saw life evolved. Constantly, we are… Uh, in every temple you go, there is a snake, there are various symbolisms all around the place, because even today in your brain, one part of your brain is a reptilian brain. You know, the core part of your brain is still a reptilian brain and it still functions and we have different practices in yoga as to how to transcend this reptilian brain and allow the cerebral cortex to function. And today we have scientific evidence to show you. The University of California has done scientific studies on Shambhavi Mahamudra, the basic practice we teach usually. And they say if you practice Shambhavi Mahamudra for three months, the neuronal regeneration increases by 241 percent, a kind of percentage that's never been recorded in the history of any kind of research, okay? Just a simple practice for twenty-one minutes, 241 percentage increase in your brain function and neuronal regeneration. This means as you grow old, you will become more intelligent. Usually young people think you're getting stupid. Yes, your brain is actually growing, you understand? It's getting better by the day. Now there is scientific evidence. We alway, always knew this, but today a meter has to say it. If a man says it, it's not true. If a man says it, it's doubtful. But a meter has to say it, now the meters are saying it. The meters are saying your brain is actually growing by doing a simple twenty-one mini minute practice. And you don't believe the meter. You just do the practice for three months and see, you will see how clear and how smart your mind is suddenly. Sadhguru Namaskar, I just wanted to know what is the importance of doing shraddha? In the manifestation of life, the physical life, there is… let me separate this, there is life and physical life for the sake of understanding. The physical life has manifested itself, the physical life energy which generally is referred to as prana or prana has five basic manifestations. There are ten but that will complicate the five basic manifestations. These are called samana, prana, udhana, apana and vyana. When a person is declared, let's say if, if a doctor is observing and they declare that person at a particular moment that he is dead now. In the next twenty-one to twenty-four minutes, samana will start exiting. That means samana is in charge of maintaining temperature in the body. First thing that happen starts happening is body starts cooling down. Somewhere between forty-eight to sixty-four minutes, prana exits. After that, between six to twelve hours, udhana exits. Till udhana exits, there are tantric processes with which you could revive the body. But once udhana exits, there is a, a micro, micro chance but that is an impractical chance except that it is impossible to revive the body once udhana has exited. The next thing is apana, somewhere between eight to eighteen hours, this exits. The vyana, which is the preservative nature of prana, will start exiting from beyond that. It can continue to exit up to eleven to fourteen days if it's a normal death. That is, somebody died of old age with the feebleness of life they exited. For such a person between eleven to fourteen days, certain processes will be happening in the body to show that there is some element of life like nails growing, hair, facial hair, these kind of things can be noticed. If someone has died accidentally or in other words the life was vibrant and he died, not necessarily totally crushed kind of body, still the body is intact, that body, the reverberations of this life will continue somewhere between forty-eight to ninety days. So till that time, there are things you can do for that life. What is the thing that you can do for that life? See, what has happened with death is, your, ex your experience of death is that somebody is gone. 
But the experience of that person is, he's exited the body. And simply because he's exited the body, you have no business with him, you cannot recognize him and if he comes back, you will be terrified. <laughs> the people that you love, if they pop up, yeah. there'll be terror, not love. <laughs> because your relationship is e either with their body or with their conscious mind and emotion. These things have been left behind. The body has been left behind and the conscious intellect and the discerning mind has been left behind. Now, in terms of mind, it is just a bunch of information which has certain tendencies of its own. Natural tendencies which are finding expression in a certain way, there is no discerning mind. Once there is no discerning mind, if you drop… if you put one drop of pleasantness into this mind which has no dis discerning capability, no intellect, now this pleasantness will multiply a million fold. If you put a drop of unpleasantness, that unpleasantness will multiply a million, million fold. It's like your child who doesn't have the necessary discernment, he goes out to play. He doesn't know when to come back. Till he's exhausted and he can't do any more, till then he wants to play because he has… he doesn't have the necessary discernment, okay, it's time to go. Similarly, this is an extreme state where it is much more than a child, where completely the discerning mind is absent. So now whatever quality you put into it, it will multiply a million fold. This is what is being referred to as hell and heaven. If you go into a pleasant state of existence, this is called as heaven. If you go to an unpleasant state of existence, this is called as hell. These are not geographical locations. These are experiential realities that a, a life which has become disembodied is going through. So what people are trying to do how well it is done or how ridiculously it is done today is a different matter, but there is a whole science what to do at different steps. One of the first things you must notice is, traditionally I don't know if you're still keeping it in Mumbai, maybe it's all gone, but if somebody dies, there will be people, the first thing they will do is they'll tie the big toes of the dead body together. Do you still do it or gone? Yes, it's very important because Tying up the big toes will tighten up the muladhara in a certain way, so the body cannot be invaded or attempts to invade the body by that life once again because that, bo that life has not lived with the awareness knowing that this is not me. It is always believed this is me, though it has come out, it tries to enter through any orifice that is there in the body particularly through the muladhara because that's, li that's where life generates and as body starts cooling down, the only region where warmth will remain till the last point, the last point of warmth is always the muladhara. So it tries to get back. To avoid this, the first thing is tie the toes so that that attempt will not happen because this exiting is happening stage by stage. The reason why traditionally always we said, if someone dies within an hour and a half or maximum of four hours, you must burn the body because this act is going on. Now this is also true for the living. If someone very dear to you is dead, you know he is dead but your mind starts playing tricks. Maybe he's going to sit up just now, maybe a miracle will happen, maybe God will come and do something fantastic right now. It has never happened to anybody but still mind plays this because of the emotions that we have for that particular person. And that is the same thing is true with the life that is exited from the body. This also believes that still it can get back into the body. If you want to stop the drama, first thing is set fire to the body. One and a half hours. But those days because, you know, villages and no doctors to tell you for sure he is dead, somebody put on the funeral pyre and set fire, the guy sits up because he's not yet. <laughs> These things have happened in the past. So they stretched it to four hours so that these mistakes don't happen. But as quickly as possible, body should be taken away. If there are agriculture communities, they decided to bury because they want the forefathers and their body to go back to the soil from which they ate. You must understand, we were in a subsistence farming. We ate from that land. That land, a piece of that land is what we are holding as this body. So they wanted to put this soil back into the same soil, not somewhere else. Always you bury him in your land 
never in somebody else's land because you ate from this land. Today you're buying everything from the store and eating, you don't know where it's coming from. So, burial is not a good thing to do now. At that time there's a certain process and to see that it happens as quickly as possible, always salt and turmeric was put so that quickly it dissipates into the soil. But cremation is a good thing to do because it closes the chapter. You will see this when there's death in the family, people are crying and hollering and doing all kinds of things. The moment cremation happens, people will come back home, everything is quiet. Nobody is crying for some time because suddenly the truth has sank in, it's over, the game is up. This is not only for you, this is also for the disembodied being who's just exited because he's also in that illusion that he can get back and that stops and that's a good thing. And there are many rituals to see that you influence, that you can somehow put a drop of sweetness into that non-discerning mind so that the sweetness will multiply manifold and they will live comfortably or they will live in a, a certain self-induced heaven. That's the idea behind the rituals, if it is done properly. See, you must be like God that you are a silent partner, then it works. Just like God, whatever anybody does, learn to be like God. Never intervene in anything. Every day in the morning, every kind of idiot will tell you what you should do today. You just listen. Just like God, <laughs> marriage will work. It may not work with your profession. See, uh, you're misunderstanding this. You're trying to make this into some kind of a value system. You're trying to make it your philosophy. I will do only what works. Well, you took a oath, I will do only what works. Now you don't know what works. Because what, we, what works will not come with a oath or a commandment. What works comes with constant observation and evolution of who you are, isn't it? Hello? The same things, how you made them work, how clumsily you made something work ten years ago, the same thing you may be doing it with ease today, isn't it so? Or you may be doing it clumsily today, you are doing it well at one time. Whichever way, whichever kind of evolution has happened. So, what works is not some kind of a formula. It is an evolution of a human being to come to what works on all levels of life. Uh, this is like we… I mean you… You're just falling out of a self-help book. No, I'm not a self-help book. Do what works. Do whatever the hell you want. What's my problem? But what's the point of doing something that doesn't work? Hello? I'm not telling you you should do only what works. Do whatever the hell you want. But. For your life, because it's a limited amount of time, what is the point doing something that does not work, isn't it? Either it should work for you or it should work for people around you. If it doesn't work for you and anybody around you, what is the point of doing that damn thing? This happened. Soldiers, American soldiers were leaving on duty. So, one of them told the other, you know Steve's wife, she read three musketeers and she delivered a triplet, delivered triplets. He says, oh my God, my wife is reading Birth of a Nation. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? <laughs> That's not how it works. So don't make this into some kind of an ethic or a philosophy, I will do only what works. Well, just to see what works, 
needs lot of application even for the smallest damn things, isn't it? Hello? To do a smallest thing, like hitting a ball or kicking a ball straight, you know how much it takes? Somebody who can kick a ball where he wants, wow, the whole world is worshipping him just because he kicks a damn ball. Yes or no? Because people understand what it takes. Nobody is worshipping worshipin him because he kicks a ball, because people can see what has gone into it. Hmm? Isn't it so? People can see what has gone into to be able to kick a ball the way he is kicking, what has gone into it, his life has gone into it. So, don't make philosophies and ethics out of everything or don't tell yourself a commandment, I will do only what works. It's a good commandment, but now you don't know what works. So, <laughs> no, no, you, you need to be conscious and apply yourself to every damn thing. If you just learn this much, that you don't decide what is important and what is not important. I was in the Rally for Rivers board meeting just before I came here in New Delhi. The CII, that is the hmm, Confederation of Indian Industry, their board also participated in the Rally for Rivers board because they are looking at how to support this because slowly people are realizing the magnitude of what has been unfolded. Everybody is trying to be part of it. We have an eminent board. Uh, the CEO of the World Wildlife Fund and the water, the topmost water experts and the topmost farming, farmers producer organization people. We have a, a judge from the Supreme Court and it's a very eminent board. As uh, this Kaveri calling project was being talked about and for every question, particularly certain experts had and they were asking, I was casually telling them what to do. They said, Sadhguru, how do you know all these things? I said, right from my early childhood, I just wandered around without any purpose. Without any purpose. Simply I wandered in the jungles, in the forests, in the rivers and this. But I paid absolute attention to every plant, every insect, the air, the moisture, the works and everything. What was aimless wonder, today is becoming formidable knowledge that is not written in any damn book. For the first time, somebody is talking in a comprehensive way, not from a textbook. This was just aimless wonder. As a child, as a youth, just wandered around without any purpose. So even if it is purposeless, you can't live without attention, isn't it? Hello? So just do this one thing, stop discriminating what is important, what is not important. If you pay the same level of absolute attention to every damn thing, you will see that what is the right thing to do is a very natural process. But you have already decided what is important, what is not important, how will you evolve, what is the right thing to do? Half the world has already been given up because it's not important. You are paying attention, only you even look at somebody properly, only if they are of something to you. No, I looked at everybody, absolutely, every life every damn thing, every pebble, every moment that was happening in the earth, in the atmosphere, everything, not as a study, simply because I had eyes and I had an attention span. I paid attention to everything. Today they are saying this is something phenomenal. I was just laughing and saying, see, I just wandered aimlessly. Everybody thought I am just a vagabond. But now this aimless wandering has… is paying off in a huge way. <laughs> because it doesn't matter what the hell you're doing, small things are big things. If you are absolutely involved, absolutely, you will see, 
you will know what's the right thing to do. You are trying to live here without involvement. This is why you have morals, you have ideals, you have ideologies, you have values, you have ethics, you have commandments, because you are trying to live here without involvement. You want ready-made formula, what is the right thing to do? Thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. Did the world get fixed, I'm asking? Every goddamn school-going children knows what is the right thing to do. Has it worked? It's not worked because you think there is a substitute for involvement. There is no substitute for involvement. Where there is no involvement, there will be no life. So don't try to make formulas or ideals or ideologies out of life. All life takes is absolute involvement, unbridled involvement, not distinguishing who is who, what is what, just absolutely involved with everything that you're in touch with right now. If you do this one thing, well, according to your level of intelligence and, you know, nature also should yield. With all this, you will know what is the best thing to do given your perspective, of course. See, right now, if you bring a man of certain capability, he may do something in a given situation. That's not the right thing to do for you, isn't it? You must know what is the right thing for you to do in a given situation. You won't be able to do what he does. You must be able to do what you can do to the best of your ability. That is the right thing to do in your life. You don't try to do like somebody else. So that will be the problem the moment you decide what is the right thing to do. No, there is no ready-made solution. Involvement, there is no substitute for involvement. Where there is no involvement, there is no life. Let 2019 be a life of absolute involvement because if you want to experience this life, you need involvement. Whatever the hell you do, Will you do it with absolute involvement in the coming months? <laughs> see, see, I'm a really nice guru, okay? I'm a really nice guru because I'm not telling you this is the thing to do. Everybody who came are always trying to tell you this is the thing to do. I'm just telling you do whatever the hell you want, do it well. And that cannot be done without involvement, isn't it? Huh? Small things and big things, will you do it with total involvement? How you wake up in the morning, total involvement. How you brush your teeth, total involvement. How you shit, total involvement. How you eat, total involvement. How you do your shambhavi, total involvement. Everything that you do, you do not distinguish what is small, what is big. When I said shit, you said hee hee hee. Okay, then don't do it. <laughs> if you think it is not important or if you think it's dirty, you should not do it. I'm saying, do not make a distinction what is filthy and what is sacred. This is where the key is because involvement means unprejudiced inclusion also. The moment you say, this is sacred, this is filthy, can you involve with the filthy? Hello? You will be constipated. Yes, and then nothing will work. So 2019, a year of absolute involvement, indiscriminate involvement, not indiscriminate action, indiscriminate involvement. Can you look at a weed, at a weed outside with as much involvement as you would look at your child? This is all you need to do. Just bring this kind of involvement, unprejudiced, absolute involvement. You will see life will blossom in a wonderful way. 2019, you must blossom those who are chasing enlightenment. <laughs> just relax a bit and just be involved with whatever the hell you're doing. Life will happen in a wonderful way.
See, sleep is not a requirement in one's life. What the body requires is rest. Sleep is just one form of rest. Lot of people are beginning to think, in Tamil Nadu if somebody says, rest panikaranga means they're sleeping. <laughs> Need not be, you can sit and rest, isn't it? Yes? You can stand and also rest. You're running, if you stand, doesn't it feel like rest? You're standing, if you sit down, doesn't it feel like rest? There are many ways of resting. The most important thing is, rest means you're changing the energy equation where consumption is lowered, production is going on at the same pace. So after a period of time, you feel rejuvenated because consumption has been lowered. Essentially, you are managing the energy equation. If you are in acti activity, the consumption is more. Whatever you are producing, it's not enough. After some time, you feel exhausted because the consumption has been heavy. If you lower the consumption and increase the production, after some time you feel energized. Suppose you are running, if you run a mile, after that you can't take another step, let's say. Oh, many of you have been running for Isha marathons, Isha Vidya marathons. I wa for after forty-two kilometers, all right, whenever. After a mile or two, you can't take another step. Don't eat anything, don't drink anything. Just sit down for ten minutes. Again you find rejuvenated, isn't it? All you have done is lower the consumption, production is still at the same level. So now there are ways to lower the consumption and increase the productivity also. So if you come to a certain state of ease, when I say ease, it's not something that most people will ever understand because most people are not at ease. If you are at total ease, the system is a total ease, everything is at ease. It is well rested always, it is rested. Because it's so rested throughout the day, if you sleep in the afternoon, do you see you can't sleep much in the night? Yes? Oh, you're always exp experimenting? <laughs> if you sleep in the afternoon, you can't sleep much in the night unless you're sick or you're very tired because of something. Because it's well rested in the day, it can't sleep in the night. So you don't have to necessarily sleep. If you sit here also, if your body is resting, you will see your sleep quota will naturally shrink. How to increase the quality of sleep? Don't try to increase the quality of sleep. The ideal way to live is, there is no sleep in my life. But that's not possible right now, still body has some inertia. So it sleeps minimum. Rest of the time, it is at ease. If you keep this at ease, then sleep does not occur to the body unless it comes to a certain point of exhaustion. So body is never ever asking for sleep, but it is definitely asking for rest. If you do not know how to sit here in a restful manner, it will try to rest <laughs> like this. If you can sit here totally at ease, it will sit here for hours without falling asleep. Otherwise, this is the only way it knows how to rest. So do not try to increase the quality of sleep, there's no such thing. Just learn to keep your body restful and at ease consciously. If you sit here now, one simple thing you can do is you sit down, you come and sit down here, just move your attention from the top of your head down to your toes and see if everything is loose and easy and relaxed and at ease. Are you sitting like this? <laughs> sit, just bring this to ease as much as you can. Not everything is in your conscious level. As much as you can consciously, bring it to ease. You will see suddenly if you are the kind who will fall asleep at ten o'clock, 
If you simply one hour you sit here at ease, you will see your sleep will get postponed by half an hour. You won't feel sleepy at ten. Naturally you're awake. So instead of trying to increase the sleep quality, no, you increase the quality of life. If you increase the quality of life, when I say increasing the quality of life, nothing in your life, whatever you may be doing, from simple breathing to any complex activity that you do in your life, the quality of that will not improve if you cannot do it with ease. Is that so? Hmm? Only when you can do something with total ease, Let's say you're riding a bicycle, if you're riding like this, like this, you can't say you're enjoying your cycling. If you can ride it with ease, with so much ease that even if you take off your hands, it'll go only straight, the way you want it to go. You're at ease. Because that you're at ease, the quality of your cycling has improved, isn't it? So these two things are connected. So if you enhance the quality of your life, naturally sleep quota will go down. If the quality of your life goes bad, you can't do anything with ease, then also you cannot sleep, but stressfully you cannot sleep. Not because you're well rested, you cannot sleep, you cannot sleep because you're stressed out. If you do this, you will not live long. If you, your body does not get enough rest, it will die, it will break, something will go. If you are not at ease, that means you are in dis-ease <laughs> You're heading there. You are in dis-ease means you're in a certain state of ill health. But if we say you're diseased, that means you're dead. So don't move in… stay into the direction of disease. move into the direction of ease. If you become totally ease, sleep quality… sleep quota will come down. Quality of sleep will be good because quality of life is good. You want to increase only the quality of your sleep, life does not work like that. If you wake up well in the morning, you will also sleep well in the night. <laughs> There's a whole lot of systems. To give this to people, in the Eastern cultures, in India particularly, all the systems are built into one's life, of course they're throwing it away because they all became modern. Modern means to be distressed, constantly in tension, agitated, worked up about everything, that means you're really modern. Otherwise, traditionally, all these things were built in from morning when you wake up till you go to sleep, what you should do, how you should handle yourself, all these things were fixed. Till the beginning of this generation, everybody was aware, suddenly they all became English educated and they become modern and tense. <laughs> Otherwise, this was called achara vichara, what to do, what not to do. Everything is built from morning to night, all aspects of life, how to do it. If you do it like that, so that you can do everything with ease, as much ease as possible. So those who are not able to dedicate their life to yoga and spiritual process, for them it was built into natural culture, at least this much ease you know, that so that you wake up happily and go to sleep and sleep well. Even today, this is a thing that they will say in India. If you… if people say, what's happened, you know, this happened, that happened in my life, they say, that, oh, that's okay, but in my life, if I lie down, I sleep well. Hmm? He might have made so much money, it's okay, but I sleep well. You, you see, hear this, people say, say this, this part of the cultural expression, I sleep well means I'm living well. Only because I live well, I can sleep well. If I'm not living well, I cannot sleep well. So do not try to increase the… improve the quality of your sleep, improve the, improve the quality of your life, then you will naturally sleep well also. We appreciate you being part of this incredible journey. Keep exploring our channel for more inspiration and transformative insights.